This is Chapter 6, Lecture 2, Volcanoes and Volcanic Hazards. We'll start off with a composite volcano. Look at the eruption column. What you have here is tephra and gas rising high into the atmosphere. Tephra settles around the volcano. The ash can drift long distances. You can also have uh, pyroclastic flows down the base of the volcano. And those are violent eruptions of hot gases, ash, and angular rock fragments. They're very destructive. You don't want to be in the pathway of a pyroclastic flow. You can also have on the side here uh, lava flows and domes. Those can erupt from the summit of a volcano or on the flanks of the volcano. They have moderate to high viscosity, so they move slowly. And then the viscous lava breaks into blocks. You can also have landslides and mud flows, sometimes referred to as lahar. Um, so large volcanoes have snow and rain at their summit, like at the top. When the volcano erupts, snow melts, causing a mud flow called a lahar. So with steep slopes, um, you can have loose rocks as well, and loose ash, those will all contribute to the hazards of the mud flow or the lahar. Rock types um, associated with composite volcanoes. You can have andesite. This is from Mount Hood in Oregon. Tephra uh, from the eruption column. So it's kind of an ashy looking rock. It's mixed with volcanic ash and lithified material. And then material from pyroclastic flows might look like this. Tough as well. Rhyolite, um, Belsic rock, and then loose debris. So you can have mud flow deposits coming from the crater. We saw that with Mount St. Helens in Washington. All right, one of my favorite volcanoes, um, Mount Vesuvius. So what we have here is the eruption that was in AD 79 and the modern limits of Naples. If Vesuvius were to erupt again, we actually find that much of Naples would be affected and in danger um, because we know that material was deposited all around this area. You may have seen these casts of, of people who fell victim to this eruption. Uh, plaster was poured into these areas and actually filled in um, the open space where people died and were buried rapidly. Now, in this area, three million people are roughly live there. Um, there was some warning for the eruption. Uh, it started with earthquakes and then the eruption column did form. After that, we had tephra falling and then six different pyroclastic flows, three of which hit Pompeii. So you can't predict exactly how a volcano will erupt. I mean, in geology, the past can be the present. Uh, the, the past can be the key <laughs> to the present um, as well as the present is the key to the past. But if there are warning signs of Mount Vesuvius erupting, this whole area should be evacuated. All right, Mount St. Helens. We're looking at a picture of it and then a cross section of Mount St. Helens. This is prior to the 1980 eruption. Okay. We had a central vent and layers of lava flows, pyroclastic rocks and mud flows. So this is its eruptive history, you know, having these different types of geologic materials. There were some 
there was evidence for horizontal um, eruptions of ash. The March 1980 earthquakes that happened prior to the big eruption um, were caused by the movement of magma in the subsurface. And then by April 1980, a bulge formed on the north side, producing an unstable slope. And then on May 18th, 1980, an earthquake triggered an avalanche. The bulge actually slid off the north side. And then that lowered pressure caused a lateral blast of magma to erupt. So there were warning signs, and then there was the huge eruption. All right, so back to volcanic domes. You can have, like in this case, a rubbly appearance because the outer surface of the dome consists of angular blocks of rocks. They usually form in clusters and they can erode over time into less obvious dome shapes. So this older one looks kind of rubbly. This newer one is smoother um, in the Mount St. Helens domes. This is an old dome preserved in a canyon wall in Arizona. So it's kind of cool to see it in cross section. But how are they formed? All right. So volcanic domes grow from the inside as magma is injected into the interior of the dome. So coming up. And new material causes the dome to expand upward and outward. And they grow as the magma breaks through the Earth's surface. And that will also fracture the partially solidified outer crust on the dome. That's how they form. But how are they destroyed? These uh, flanks get steeper and steeper over time with more magma, and then eventually they can collapse. That collapse unleashes an avalanche of ash and blocks of the dome itself. And the dome explosion produces projectiles, and you can also have pyroclastic flows associated with that. So you have explosions from the buildup of gases as well. Some of the rocks associated with volcanic domes are obsidian. And that's volcanic glass that forms from rapidly cooling lava. It's dark, but it actually has a felsic composition. You can have volcanic breccia. Uh, that's where outer parts of the dome cool and fracture into blocks. You can also have what's called tuff and volcanic breccia mixed together with the collapse of a dome. Here's an example of a dome collapsing in Japan. This dome collapsed repeatedly between 1990 and 1995. 10,000 small pyroclastic flows uh, were produced from that and people became interested in it people, including photographers and volcanologists. Um, in 1991, a larger pyroclastic flow from the dome collapse killed 43 people, and the damage was really concentrated along the lowest parts of the valley. Like I said previously, you don't want to be in the pathway of a pyroclastic flow. Let's look at the Valles caldera and the topography of it. It is circular with steep walls. It has flat hills, um, or flat areas, excuse me, and hills in the circular area. And steep walls around this as well. It's really a central depression surrounded by steep walls. And these low areas collect sediment and ash. The small mountains inside the caldera are actually domes. Here's a cross section of the Valles caldera. So 
a huge volume of magma erupted from a shallow magma chamber. And then these faulted, these black lines are faults, these faulted blocks dropped relative to rocks that are outside of the caldera. So that's your depression. There's thick uh, layers of volcanic ash inside and outside of the caldera. And the hills inside the caldera are rhyolite domes constructed after the main eruption. So here's uh, an idealized um, stages of the formation of a caldera. Stage one, we have felsic magma accumulating in magma chambers. Stage two, magma reaches the surface and erupts. The roof of the magma chamber subsides as the magma chamber is evacuated and then circular fractures form. With stage three, the eruption of felsic magma forms eruption columns and pyroclastic flows. And then much of that falls back into the caldera. You can also see landslides off of the steep walls. Some of the tephra escapes and covers the surrounding area. Stage four is where magma may rise through fractures along the edge and interior forming domes. So that's the last thing to happen. If you want, you can sketch this and describe the stages to cement it in your mind. There's some features formed by caldera eruptions. This is the Long Valley Caldera. It can have uh, ash and ash rich sediment. And we're going to show you rocks from top to bottom in a caldera. Um, so ash rich sediment formed from pyroclastic eruptions as the magma chamber emptied. You can have uh, welded tuff or welded ash, where ash and pumice welded into hard rock with fragments of rocks from the caldera walls. And below that, you would have granite forming in the subsurface as finely crystalline material uh, in the magma chamber. So from top to the bottom. All right, we'll look at Santorini in Greece. Um, this is an old caldera in the center. So we have cliffs of ash, pumice, and rock fragments that formed one to two million years ago. These islands encircle a submerged caldera, which formed as a magma chamber and emptied during eruptions. These steep cliffs are the remnants of the original wall of a caldera. In fact, it appears that the collapse of the caldera produced a wave that traveled southward across the sea, probably hitting Crete. And up to 50 meters of ash and pumice have been excavated um, to uncover an ancient city. I don't have the dates on that. I recommend looking it up, but that's really cool. Um, really unfortunate, but geologically it's really cool. All right. And then Krakatoa, I like to say Krakatoa, uh, Indonesia. We had these three volcanoes before an 1883 eruption. Uh, the largest volcanic island was Krakatoa. This was a densely populated area with most of the population living along the coast because, I mean, living on a steep slope is not an easy life. You don't want to do it. Okay. But in 1883, we had a eruption with a lot of tephra. It formed a huge eruption column and pyroclastic flows. That eruption uh, was accompanied by explosions landslides, a caldera collapse, and destruction of the two nearby volcanoes. It's just obliterated everything um, in the vicinity. So after that eruption, only Krakatoa 
remained. Um, it looked something like this. And then a small volcano grew within the caldera. So the Anak Krakatoa, um, really the child of this one. It's pretty cool. And it's well documented because it really didn't happen very long ago in 1883. There were witnesses to this. It affected the entire planet, really. All right. So let's look at the Yellowstone caldera and Wyoming. And Yellowstone is partially um, in Montana as well. The red line shows the area of the Yellowstone caldera, which formed about 640,000 years ago. We have a cross section through Yellowstone that shows faults, earthquakes, and the position of the magma. Looks kind of mild in cross section. Um, but what we do know, geologists have mapped out um, previous ash beds. Um, so you have, um, first of all, the ash bed that is in greatest concentration. This is what the Mount St. Helens ash bed looked like. Although I said some of the particles tra traveled further based on eyewitness accounts of, say, my family at the time in Michigan. Um, but yeah, so you have this small caldera, um, but it had enormous eruptions and ash deposits that are like this large from three different eruptions. Um, it just so happens that the average time between eruptions at Yellowstone is about 70,000 years. Now, we can't predict everything perfectly, right? Um, but it's been 640,000 years since the last eruption, so who knows what might happen in the future. Now, this um, is the result of a hot spot. Um, this map shows the age of eruptions that we see along the Snake River Plain. Alright, so the continent moves over the hot spot, right? And it used to be here, it used to be here, it used to be here. Um, now the hot spot is here with the Yellowstone caldera. Uh, North America moves southward over the hot spot, leaving a path across Idaho. The volcanic rocks are youngest near Yellowstone, and they become older to the southwest. Excuse me, I should have said it moved northward over the hot spot. Anyway, um, that's the path, and if you look at um, Google Earth even, you'll see the Snake River Plain is like a lower area across Idaho um, to Wyoming. And over here we have the Columbia Plateau Flood Basalts. All right. So looking at this volcano, my question is, how could we assess the danger posed by this volcano? This is the Augustine Volcano in Alaska. Well, we can look at the shape. These steep slopes are more dangerous than, say, um, gentle slopes. We'll look at the rock types as well. If you see the welded tufts, pyroclastic flows, rhyolite, or andesite, that would suggest the volcano is quite dangerous compared to mafic magma, such as bas oh, mafic uh, rocks, such as basalt. The age of it, um, that's important. Um, we want to see how much it's really eroded and perhaps date the rocks that we find there to indicate the age of the last eruption. Maybe it's dormant. Maybe there's no longer a magma chamber as well um, and it's not going to be a danger. Some other things, well, yeah, you look at the history of the eruptions for that, but some other data uh, could include Kempel 
chemical compositions of the rocks, um, gas emissions, if there are any, would be very important to look at um, to assess the hazard here in this volcano. I'm looking at this volcano, what areas would have the highest risk to living things? What are some factors to consider? All right, so one thing would be your proximity to the volcano. It looks like Village 2 is kind of the closest. Um, valleys are preferential areas for lava or pyroclastic flows to travel or mud flows. So if you're sitting in the valley, I mean, that's kind of dangerous, right? This one doesn't appear to have the most direct pathway to it, but these two do. Um, wind direction? It looks like the wind's blowing this way. Maybe this is the prevailing wind direction, so Village 3 could get quite a bit of ash, pumice. Um, most regions have a prevailing wind direction. Like in the Saginaw Bay area, the prevailing wind direction is typically southwest. All right. And we want to look at the history of what is known about how this volcano may have erupted or any earthquakes associated with it over time. Um, that could indicate uh, what part of the volcano is most dangerous. You could also map the actual deposits, um, use seismometers to image where the magma is, and look at the tilt of this volcano. What regions on Earth have a high risk for volcanic activity? Well, subduction zones as such, right? Um, Continental and oceanic rifts, like here. Continental, oceanic. Um, and hot spots, like in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii, thank you. So, composite volcanoes, those are in highest concentration along the Pacific Ring of Fire. They form continental arcs and island arcs. Calderas are mostly subduction related or occur in the middle of the continent over hot spots or rifts, such as the East African Rift. Shield volcanoes will occur along lines or clumps of islands and submarine mountains, such as Hawaii and the Galapagos. How do we, or geologists, monitor volcanoes? We look at seismic activity. So increased seismic activity. You measure ground shaking with seismometers. And we see a spike here between June 15th and 16th, and that's something. Geologists can also look at increased gas activity. You can have instruments on the ground or on airplanes measuring the amount of sulfur dioxide generated by a volcano. If we see more, that's cause for concern. The amount increases before an eruption. It can also indicate sealing of a conduit, a preferential flow pathway for lava. We'd also look at changes in topography. Um, you can do this remotely, remote sensing satellites. Uh, you could survey it directly with equipment such as this. Um, which measures the distance between the instrument and a distant target. And geologists can also look at changes in temperature. This satellite image shows hot areas um, in red and yellow and cooler blue areas here. This is Augustine in Alaska. We'll look at the area near Mount Rainier and consider the potential processes and volcanic hazards associated with that. So here's Mount Rainier. Um, so material from Mount Rainier could come down the river valley towards Tacoma. This is a valley. This is a valley. Eruption of ash could cover the area if wind is blowing that way.
many of these river valleys could channel mud flows and other materials into Tacoma. That's something to be aware of. What kind of volcano is Mount Rainier? It is andesitic in composition. It formed on an eroded surface of granite. The top is a younger volcanic cone constructed within an older crater. And then snow and ice on the top pose hazards for mud flows or lahar. And we can look at the plate tectonic setting of this entire region with Mount Rainier and consider what type of volcanoes are common in this setting. So this is a subduction zone. Water can be introduced. We have partial melting of the crust. Um, these are composite volcanoes. And the plate boundary is between the North American plate and the Juan de Fuca plate. The Juan de Fuca plate is moving eastward with respect to um, the North America, and it's subducting into the mantle. Now, the Cascade Range is the north-south belt of composite volcanoes, and Cascade volcanoes extend north into Canada and south into Oregon and California. The melting here of the mantle and continental crust results in intermediate composition magma. Zooming in closer to Mount Rainier, uh, these are some of the possible hazards that we're highlighting. You've got mud flows of all sizes, some actually reaching Tacoma historically before it was Tacoma. Um, those are highlighted in yellow and I guess peach and orange. And the lava and pyroclastic flows do not look like they threaten Tacoma based on the history here. We see those in green. They're kind of localized to the mountain itself. So if you're not right up on the mountain, um, your greatest risk is the mud flows. This is an interesting chart. Um, it's just showing the frequency of eruptions of volcanoes in the Cascades during the past 4,000 years. And in geologic time, that is just nothing. That's recent. So 10 volcanoes in the U.S. that are part of the Cascades erupted in the last 4,000 years. Mount St. Helens is the most active. Look at all the frequency of eruptions in the last 4,000 years. Um, but yeah, we have Mount Rainier as well. That has erupted in the last 200 years. Um, Mount Hood, frequent, or er, recent eruption, relatively. Lassen as well, Mount Shasta. So it's an active area. There's a lot going on here. And with that in mind... We will stop here for this chapter.